The Articles of Confederation were written in accordance with early America's widespread dislike of centralized government to ensure that the Confederation Congress was weak, and thus incapable of infringing on the rights of the individual states. While it served this purpose, this weakness produced a number of problems. The Articles of Confederation did not allow the federal government to levy taxes. Supporters viewed this as a natural ruling, citing British taxation as the primary motivator for the revolution. However, while the inability to levy taxes pleased those who viewed federal taxation in this tyrannical light, it left the Confederation Congress perpetually running on an ever-increasing budget deficit and incapable of paying back the fledgling America's war debts, a task which was therefore left to the states, who ran up further debts with lenders as a result. In addition to causing monetary issues for the national government, the Articles of Confederation produced a flawed system of representation. Each state was given a single representative and vote within the Confederation Congress, meaning that the smallest and least populous of states had equal say in policy as the largest and most densely populated ones did. This caused discontent among delegates from larger states, such as Virginia, who found their state holding no more power than Rhode Island, despite having well over ten times the population. These issues, in particular that of taxation, were why some felt a revision was in order. In 1787, there was a rebellion in Massachusetts, prompted by the state siding with creditors over poor farmers who were indebted to them. Due to the weak nature of the federal government at this time, it was unable to quash this rebellion, leaving the state of Massachusetts to raise its own army instead. As Alexander Hamilton would later note in an address to the Congress, Examine the present confederation, and it is evident they cannot raise troops, nor equip vessels before war is actually declared. They cannot therefore take any preparatory measure before an enemy is at your door. The rebellion in Massachusetts brought the revisionist movement to a head, and on May 15, 1787, 55 delegates from 12 of the 13 states began meeting with the stated intention of revising the Articles of Confederation. The convention was directed by the basic principles that the national government should gain its power from the people and have authority over the people directly, rather than being granted power and having authority over only the state governments. While early on the plan was simply to revise the Articles of Confederation, by the end, the delegates had drafted an entirely new constitution for the USA. On account of this fact, this convention is now known as the Constitutional Convention. One point of debate was on how to organize Congress. James Madison's Virginia Plan aimed to rectify the issue of disproportionate representation by dividing Congress into two houses, in which the representation each state held would be proportional to its population size or tax base. In opposition stood the New Jersey Plan, which sought to maintain the system established by the Articles of Confederation, in which each state was given an equal number of votes in a single house Congress, while still increasing Congress's power. The dispute between these two plans was settled through the Great Compromise, which determined Congress should be divided into two houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate, in which the states would be represented according to their population sizes, and in which each would be given two seats, respectively. It included an additional measure of compromise in regards to how state populations were to be counted. Slave states supported counting slaves among their populations, despite their inability to vote, while critics opposed counting them. Within the Great Compromise, the Three-Fifths Compromise was ratified, making each slave count as three-fifths of a person when determining representation. Another compromise was the so-called Dirty Compromise between the anti-slavery states of New England and the pro-slavery Deep South, which determined that the importation of slaves would be halted after a 20-year grace period. A final major controversy was in regards to how the executive branch of the federal government should function. While some proposed a council, others argued in favor of granting a single person power over the entire executive branch. To critics such as Patrick Henry, this idea was too close to monarchy. However, this criticism was handily repudiated by Alexander Hamilton, who argued that the state governors had a greater claim to being monarchs than an elected executive who could be impeached. Henry's argument was ultimately not enough to convince most members of the convention, and after months of deliberation, it was decided that the executive branch would be run by a single individual. It was further decided that, as a compromise between election by Congress and election by the people, this president would be elected through an electoral college. This has just been a brief overview of some of the controversies which led to compromise in the Constitutional Convention. If you'd like a more in-depth video discussing the Constitutional Convention as a whole, with all its controversies and context, please leave a comment so that I can get a gauge on what kind of audience engagement I would get from that. 
Thanks for watching everybody, and please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. I've been Soma, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.